ever. This is the best rupture party you've ever thrown. Ever. Looks at Sandra. Not boring at all. Bill, with concern. You weren't going to kill yourself, being that God pulled a yet another uh, pulled yet another no show for you, are you? Uh, no show on you, are you? <sighs> I can't believe it, Bill. It, it just seems so perfect. It seemed like Jeremiah forty nine was all set to go. Then again, nothing. Am I insane? Am I really, truly out of my mind, out of my head with this? This. Then Bill says, "I think only you can really answer that for yourself." Then Ted to Wine Green. With sadness in his eyes. What do you think? Be truthful. Be no beating around the bush, okay? Dr. Wine Green. Ted, I'll be uh, honest with you. No one in this world is really truly ha really truly sane. Everyone has some breaking point that will make them and I cross mine, right? I didn't say that. I think you're an intelligent person, even as intelligent as the next person. The only trouble with you is you really have a great imagination and are very creative. And you are as about as creative as my grandparents are creative. Creative to, creative to the point where they can come up with wild interpretations on reality. Yeah, that's right. You're trying to tell me something uh, about them. What was it that you're trying to tell me? Well. As I was saying earlier, they too were intelligent. They were actually brilliant. Yet, when my grandfather was killed, my rational grandmother began to think irrational. I mean, here she was, a brilliant atheist, and yet she ended up believing the stupidest things from a medium, for crying out loud. Believing that her dead beloved husband was talking through this lady. What well, was so painful? It was all the thousands of dollars the sociopath was taking from my grandma's savings. Then Ted says, And so, what are you getting at? That doesn't take stupidity to believe really stupid things. When life is boring to you, as you told me it was, and when life becomes painful and lonely, as you have also told me it was, your subconscious will try to seek out some way, either through drugs or religion, to dealt the pain. You see, there is really nothing different between Bible prophecy and what that sociopath was saying to my grandmother. Both of them send out words that, if they sound good enough to you, like, uh, I still love you, Maud, even in the astral plane, as it was with my grandmother, or Russia is, slo is slowing the dismantling of its nuclear weapons and the ashes of the red heifer have finally been found, maybe, maybe, as it is in your case, uh, this helps feel some void in you that is, well, believed. And at the same time, one will completely, subconsciously ignore the words or news events that will completely and utterly contradict what you want to hear and believe. And only simple time will be the downfall of your hopeful beliefs as so often happens to all those who are into Bible prophecy and other theories that have a religious timetable with them. Rogers says, So Ted, uh, feeling better? Ted's smiling. Yeah, much better. I feel great. Teresa, really? You know, I would really like to be alone, if you don't mind. This the suicide party is over, okay? Teresa asks, uh, when do you think we'll have another party like this? Roger then says, the next time Iraq is threatening its neighbors, I guess. Teresa and Roger start uh, getting their stuff, which will probably be in uh, about ten years when the Kurds when the Kurds start getting bored with the fact that no one is oppressing them anymore. Bill says, Gosh, Ted, are you going to be all right? Sure, why not? Well, you sure don't seem all right, to Doc, to Wine Green. If you were Ted, what would you do? Wine Green says, I think Ted needs to make more contacts with the outside world. Then to Ted, I think you have been isolating yourself too much from real people, Ted. When you are lonely, and I know that you are, 
your subconscious will try to find something to fill that void like my grandmother did with that sociopath when she got her going by asking her is there anyone in close to you in your family whose first name starts with a j only in your case uh it's reading too many newspapers uh watching too many episodes of the show ezekiel 38 robert what's ezekiel 38 uh christian prophecy show oh also ted you really need to associate yourself with those who are happy and realize that they're going to be dead someday ted and you're happy no one is really truly happy ted but i'm not depressed like someone i know if i were you i would really try to lay off something i really try to lay off watching the news and especially dump the dot the bible prophecy reading ted i haven't been into bible prophecy for nearly five years only today dr warren green really huh well, instead of dwelling on the negative aspects of the Bible, dwell on the parts that make it sound like God is love and merciful. Roger. I don't see how Ted can do that, man. God kills his family in a car accident, nearly burns Ted to death in the family in the accident, then ten years later, on the anniversary of his tra of his tragedy, teases him again with the idea that he'll be reunited with his wife and little girl tonight, yet yanks his hope away again. Ted how can you stand to be a Christian? How? Because, because if there's a God, then there's a chance that I'll see Christy and Sally again. And you think that something that keeps on teasing you every few years with a mirage known as the rapture is going to care if you see, ever see them again? Wake up, Ted. Smell the coffee. This crappy religion of yours is keeping you in the grief state. It's not allowing you to move on. You aren't living, you are existing. This may hurt you, friend, but it's for your own good. Your wife and little girl are dead. They are dead, they are gone, and you will never see them again. Bill shouting, how can you say that to him like that? Roger, this rapture shit is stifling his life. It's keeping him from living. Every time a night like this goes by and there is no rapture, I expect to find Ted dead, or worse, shut up in, in an, inside an insane asylum, and yet he keeps on going on, getting raped and shit on by this cruel religion of his all the time, and he wants to throw it on to me and Teresa as well? You're doing just the opposite, man. Teresa, my word, Roger. And you think I'm harsh on Teddy? I'm not hard. I'm not angry with Ted. Ted's a great guy, but... It makes me angry to see him abuse himself in a religion that is, well, really, it, it's raping and fucking with his mental health. I'm afraid the guy is going to commit suicide any day now, especially when he said that tonight was a night. When he thought it never looks so good for the rapture to take place. Bill says, are you going to, be, are you going to commit suicide now, Ted? Ted. Christians aren't supposed to commit suicide. Roger. No, they're just supposed to suffer is all. But are you? No. Dr. Weingreen, do you think you will need any Prozac then? Then Ted says, you know, I really haven't been into Bible prophecy that much. It just seems like it because I was so heavily into it 20 years ago. That picture I painted really helped get it into my head, into my mind, that the rapture is what Roger said it was 20 years ago. A mirage. Because I painted that picture and put it on the wall, it has kept me from watching Christian prophecy shows like Ezekiel 38. If you want to know the truth, my faith in God was really shot. When I woke up this morning, I think I was probably more of an atheist than any of you, any, any one of you. and. I was really thinking of doing myself in. And you are wrong, Dr. Weingreen. For the past five years, at least, I haven't been watching the news all the time. I haven't been reading the newspapers. I do think I need to co-mingle with the people more, though. And what was taking place in the Middle East today took me totally by surprise. But you know, maybe today was a gift from God to me, to, to me. I know, I know that sounds insane, and even though it was horrible watching all those thousands of people die in the Shalom Tower, 
hotel six hours ago, it it was kind of like God was saying to me, these deaths aren't an accident. I, Elohim, still exist. The prophecy of Jeremiah can still ring true. And you, Ted Jameson, will someday not only see your wife and little girl again, but everyone will see their loved ones again as well. Roger. Yeah, burning for eternity in a lake of fire. How wonderful. Bill. So you aren't, so you'll be okay. I think I will. If I can see this day as something that was something more than mere coincidence, uh, something not as a day that the rapture was near, but as a day signaling that the anniversary of my family's death was not some godless accident, I, I think I will be. Okay. Bill. Well, good. Now maybe we can get go home and not worry about you. Roger at the door. She will probably kill me, but I don't want to take your money. I don't want to take your thousand, okay? I see. I, I say. I say. Use that money to pick up women while you still have some looks, okay? Ted. Uh, yeah. I'm serious, man. Robert shakes Ted's hand. Things were looking uh, really scary there for a moment. I'm just wondering. Well, if the Kurds didn't kill Ali Mahdi. Maybe something would have taken place over there? Something nuclear? Teresa, yeah, right. I'm leaving. Bye, says her head, goes to the door. Well, things were escalating, then Robert says, well, things were certainly, well, things were escalating quickly over there. It seemed as though the weapons of Ali Amadi were becoming stronger with each attack. As Teresa disappears out the door, and those were cruise missiles we later found out. Ted Teresa, to Teresa, Goodbye. And then to Roger. Is your wife driving? No, but she has the keys to the car. Suddenly the TVs in the theater come on with a sign saying GNN special report. Oh crap, not again. Michelle is seen again. Look a little uh, rushed. Sandra. Gee, doesn't she ever look, doesn't she ever not look worried? Michelle. This is Michelle Takashi, reporting from the GNN newsroom in Tokyo. Right when it looked like it was over, we were getting we are getting more dis more news out of the Middle East, and now it sounds very disturbing. From our sister station in Tel Aviv, we are getting reports of dozens, I repeat, dozens of missiles being launched from the Baghdad area. Ted Shani. What? Roger. Here we go again. Michelle, what is so distress disturbing about this latest report is that all missiles have dropped off radar screens like the ones that hit Israel last. Like the ones that hit, that last hit Israel. Oh man, oh man. Before they vanished, it looked as though they were just, were not just headed toward Israel and Saudi Arabia, but to most countries in the Persian Gulf region. Ted, what? Roger, I don't believe this. We are now getting a call from Terry Jenkins, who was stationed in Riyadh. Can you hear me, Terry? The TV screens show a man holding a microphone as he stands on the roof. The sounds of air raid sirens are heard in the air. Terry, this is Terry Jenkins reporting up on the roof on downtown Riyadh. It's believed that seven cruise missiles from the Baghdad area will soon start slamming into city structures here in Riyadh. Michelle superimposed. Aren't you afraid for your own safety? Of course, but being that cruise missiles are expensive and are designed to hit very valuable targets, I feel I feel somewhat safe. I take it you aren't standing on the Riyadh Defense Ministry. You've got it, Michelle. And I'll try to get the best pictures to you despite orders not to. It's pretty creepy that Iraq was able to hide such formidable weapons from the world. I just heard that Riyadh isn't the only country that has cruise missiles traveling toward it. This is just the first in the in in the la in this slave's attack. Michelle, Terry, do you think it's wise to be up on uh, to be up on a roof when Mahdi uh, made the threat that he had H bombs, and was ready to use them if the Kurds were to overthrow him? Terry, going white like a ghost. He said that, didn't he? Yes, he did. And if he has cruise missiles, Terry looks about. Uh, Come on, guys, let's pack it. Uh, if Bonnie was able to hide cruise missiles, uh, and let's get us off this damn roof. Male voice heard shouting, Terry, look. What, what the? What the? A zooming sound is heard. Michelle, what? What, what, what do you see? Terry, can you get that on camera? Uh, voice of a cameraman, uh, it's, it's too smoky. 
Michelle. Then Terry says, Michelle, the seven cruise missiles just passed over our heads. One was so close, I felt as though I could have touched it. Damn, we missed it. Michelle says, can you show us where the tails lead off to? Yes, it's, it's kind of strange that we didn't hear any explosions. The trails look as though they were, that they, it looks as though they end up in the city. Well, show us. I, I will. Terry starts looking as though he's starting to breathe hard. Means, Terry, what's wrong? You look like you're shivering. I feel as though someone's putting electrical current through me and, and now turning out the juice. Ah! <laughs> Turn out the juice. <laughs> wow! The camera turns all in all directions and points to the roof as the cameraman falls in front of it, twitching and convulsing wildly, blood coming out of his nose and mouth. T Michelle screaming, Ah! Ah! Michelle, voice of producer, Kato Tokyo! Kato Tokyo! Cuts to Michelle. Michelle says, Tai no! Ted to his guests, Now do you believe me? Roger, it, it can't be. It can't be. Teresa coming back. What's taking you so long, uh, uh, Teresa? Uh, Tr Teresa coming back. What's taking you so long, Roger? A horrified Roger points to the TV. Gad. Uh, yeah. Gad, doesn't that bitch ever have anything uplifting to report? Why is she looking so disturbed this time? Roger. Riyadh was just gassed. Sure it was. Voice of producer. Can you go to? Can you go on, Michelle? We are getting the report from Tel Aviv. Michelle. I'll, I'll try. Dave Matsuda is seen sitting in the Tel Aviv uh, GNN newsroom with air raid sirens in the background. Dave, hello. Michelle, can you hear me? Michelle, Dave, get out of there. Why, what for? Get out of there. Now, Terry Jenkins was just gasping to death in front of our eyes in Riyadh. It was fast and horrible. So please, Dave, get out of there now. Suddenly there is the sounds of explosions in Tel Aviv making Michelle scream. No, no. Dave looking at the window. Too late, Michelle. I guess I'm dead. Voice of, uh, voice of someone in the control room. Looks, looks like a random, looks like a random attack this time. Dave. I see seven small Russian clouds bring, uh, hanging over the city of Tel Aviv. They seem to be, they seem to have just hit anything. Michelle frightened. Do you see any white clouds, uh, white, cl uh, white cloud trails, Dave? No. Why? Dave. We have got to, we, we, Dave, we will get back to you to find out about this latest attack, but we are getting a call that may answer the, that why Iraq is still attacking. You mean, we're getting a call from Baghdad. Ted, Baghdad? This I've got to hear. Turns up audio. Dave. Okay. Dave's image disappears off the screen and is replaced with a picture of reporter Edgar Roth with a map of Baghdad behind it. Michelle. Ah, uh, th that was Dave Matsuda in Tel Aviv. Now we are going to hear the latest from Edgar Roth in Baghdad. Edgar, pause. Michelle. Yes, Edgar. This is Michelle. Can you please tell us why Iraq is still launching missiles when Mahdi was supposed to have been killed? Why more missiles? Ted to his guests. My question exactly. Roth. A missile, is just, a missile has just been launched. Don't you mean missiles? No. I, I know about those, but this one was different. What do you mean by one? At exactly 12.45 Baghdad time, a large missile was launched from the Saddam Mosque. I repeat, a large missile was launched over five minutes ago from the, mosque, from the Saddam Mosque. What makes this so worrisome this time was that it was the first missile to have been fired from, a mo from the mosque. And it, it came on the heels of a very disturbing radio speech by Ali Mahdi. Ted says, he's not dead. Guests looks at each other. Michelle, you mean he's not dead? Regrettably, Ali Mahdi is still alive. He just, he was just on the radio giving the most disturbing speech on radio that I've ever heard. How disturbing. He said that there was no place for him to hide now, that all his lookalikes have been killed, and that he is ready to make Israel's sun go down at noon with the nuclear weapons he's been hiding. Ted, shouting, at noon? 
at noon. And here. He said that even though Israel has threatened to retaliate with its own nuclear missiles and it has been hiding from its UN inspectors, he believes that Allah will come to his rescue and humiliate all the enemies of Islam as he, Ali Mahdi, brings on the Day of Judgment. After concluding the speech with shouts of Allah Akbar, he added, and I quote, The hand of Allah is stretched out still. Ted, oh man, oh man, Michelle. Do you really actually believe this, this missile is to be carrying a nuclear warhead? Uh, do you really actually believe this missile to be carrying a nuclear warhead? The voice of Michelle and Edgar Roth go silent. Several seconds after Ted speaks up, the TVs go dark. Ted to his guests. <coughs> How much you want to bet that when that thing hits the ground, we see the cloud of an H-bomb? How much do you want to bet? And Roger says... I'll bet you the thousand dollars you gave me to sit through all this that nothing happens. Let's shake on it. Okay, they do. Ted then quickly gets Ted quickly then runs over to the, and begins checking up on his on the uh, on checking one of his VCRs. Ted, there is enough tape, enough for an hour, I'd say. VCR is running. Presses a button. Now, Teresa and Roger laugh. The others smile. Roger. Nothing is going to happen, ma'am. Sandra to Ted. What do you think will happen? Ted, pause. Looks at his guest. Looks sad. <sighs> you guys, Christ said that when you see the abomination that maketh desolate standing where it ought not, do not come down from off your roof, do not go in to get your coat, but let Jerusalem come into your mind. I have no idea when that missile will hit, but... When it does, hey, I really feel that the rapture will take place because of that warning Christ said over 2,000 years ago. I feel there is now only a matter of minutes left to accept Christ as your Lord and Savior so that you can be a part of the rapture and escape the hell that will break out on this world. Robert says, Will you feel like the biggest fool who ever, there ever was if nothing happens? Probably. But something is going to happen. This time, the rapture will take place. It's just too perfect. Never has it looked this good. I tell you, folks, if you aren't saved now, I believe God is giving you the last few minutes to repent and accept Christ as your Savior. God is giving you one last chance to escape the tribulation now. But time is running out. It is running out. Roger. Nothing's going to happen, Ted. Even if a nuclear war, even if a nuclear detonation in the Middle East, even if, even if, it's a nuclear detonation in the Middle East. Nothing will happen. Ted. But what about all these incredible coincidences? What about them? And that's all they are, man. That's all they are. Incredible coincidences, if even that. How can you be sure? How? Because if you if what you're saying is true, if what you are saying is really true, then that means there was a time when all the world's animals were on a big boat. And they were. Teresa laughing. Yeah, right. Roger goes on. Are you saying that the anaconda snake? Are you are you saying that the anaconda snake, uh, anaconda snake, slithered off of Mount Ararat, slithered across the Barren Straits, crossed the Rocky Mountains, and went all the way down into South America? That is so stupid. And the Bible seems to hint that the world is only six thousand years old, when all evidence points to it being much older. Looks can be deceiving. Teresa snickers. Roger. That means that the White Cliffs of Dover is a lie planted by God. White Cliffs of Dover? That's right. The whole thing is made of chalk. And what is chalk, Dr. Wygreen? 